Introduction My name is Ian Burr. I'm a graphic designer, creative director and art director. And I started being a graphic designer when I drew comic books as a kid. Eventually I became a professional designer in 2006. I started freelancing in 2010 and I published my first graphic design book in 2018. And eventually I launched a YouTube channel in 2020 during the COVID lockdown. Some of my career accomplishments have been all over. I've designed for clothing, book covers, the education sector, the corporate sector. I've designed for vlogs, food products, churches, television, the retail sector, the medical sector, restaurants, and the entertainment sector. So why take this course? Well, for a start, designers are in high demand. And with everything going online more and more, there's a growing need for visual communication. Designers can work anywhere. You can be fully remote. I've designed for clients in other countries that I've never actually met in person. And perhaps you live in South Africa, but nothing is actually stopping you from earning dollars or euros. There's good money in graphic design. And like I said, you could earn money from another country, but also if you develop a good reputation with a unique style, you can bump up your fees and rates according to your work value. You can cross-pollinate with other industries. One day you might be designing for a big car brand. The next day you might design for the movies or a gaming company. Graphic design can link you into a lot of big industries. And finally, you can forge your own career. You could end up being a designer who is known for making graphics for music artists. Perhaps you'll design a unique range of children's books. Maybe you can even design a famous movie poster or the next viral advert. Find your style and you can forge your own career. The aim of this course is to teach you the following. How to improve your visual communication skills. Perception theory, which is how the human brain responds and reacts to things like colors and shapes. Design thinking, which is problem solving on a visual spectrum. Creative interpretation, the difference between art and relaying information. Professionalism and consistency, design habits that will ensure that you get ahead in the real world. So you will understand what it takes to make a business card that looks like this into something clever, cool and professional like this. Let's get started. What is graphic design? Well, there's no easy way to answer that question. It could be making posters and business cards. It could be visual communication. It could be artistic problem solving. So let's change the question. Where is graphic design? And the answer to that is graphic design is everywhere. We see it on our watches, in our books, on our TV screens, on our social media, on our clothes, on our food, on our drinks, on our toys, on our products we use in the bathroom, on our spaceships even. Graphic design is literally everywhere. And it would be impossible to avoid graphic design in this day and age because even if you went out into the middle of the Sahara Desert, there'd be most certainly graphic design on your shirt, your sunglasses, your shoes, your hat, and even on your underwear label. Cyrus Highsmith, an American typeface designer and illustrator, did an experiment called A Day Without Helvetica in which he recorded and documented an entire normal working day, all while avoiding a well-used typeface, Helvetica, which we'll explore later on in this course. Right from the start of the experiment, he struggles as his clothing labels and breakfast packaging used Helvetica. He barely survived the day but the point is even avoiding one specific typeface which falls under one specific category of graphic design is near impossible. So because graphic design is everywhere, even in your underpants, wouldn't it be cool to harness that power to some degree? Graphic design is practical. 
Okay, so we've established that graphic design is everywhere. Graphic design is and should be functional and practical. It is essentially a way of communicating things visually. If we take art and communication, see, graphic design is that golden overlap where art and communication unite. Observe this graphic. No matter whether you are Japanese, Russian, Egyptian, Italian, or Liverpudlian, you need no language to understand what the sign means. Here's another. It's just an aeroplane with an arrow, right? Or is it arrow left? You wouldn't see this in a frame on display in a fine art gallery because there's nothing breathtakingly artistic about this. But practically, this would help people to find the airport no matter what language they speak. Steve Jobs was famous for saying that design is not what it feels like or what it looks like. Design is how it works. A friend of mine once said, escalators don't break, they just become stairs. And what that means is that some designs might not be enjoyable or pleasant. Heck, they can sometimes be downright irritating. But a menu designed by a short-sighted sushi chef who thinks he's an artistic genius, written in ugly colors with an ugly font, still practically informs you about the price of a meal. Art might be in the eye of the beholder, but practicality outshines presentation, unless that presentation is botched up enough to affect the function of the design. So what does a graphic designer do? Believe it or not, a graphic designer sleeps, he puts on clothes, he eats, he exercises, he watches movies, etc. And that might be a very literal answer or even a silly answer, but it's actually quite important and here's why. Sometimes graphic designers are perceived as artists with their heads in the clouds. Sometimes graphic designers are perceived as wizards with a computer. Sometimes they have the opportunity to wow an entire generation. Sometimes graphic designers have to do menial, boring, creativity crushing tasks. From the glamorous to the downright nasty, graphic designers are seen as many things, which is why it's important to remember that a graphic designer is a good old fashioned normal everyday person. A normal everyday person with the power and responsibility to communicate with graphics and do visual problem solving. A graphic designer comes between the problem and the solution. Here's an example. We see an instruction that says, assemble the contraption by first inserting section A into slot B. And the client says that there are two problems. Number one, customers overlook or misunderstand the instruction. And number two, our non-English speaking customers cannot read the instructions at all. So as a graphic designer, you could solve this by making it visual. Present the instruction visually, eliminating language barriers and grammatical ambiguity. Don't design for brands. Design for people interacting with brands. And what that means is that you shouldn't design something because you think it looks cool. Design something for your intended audience. Find out what they like. Find out what they want to see and design it accordingly. As a graphic designer, you can do logo design, flyers, banners, infographics, packaging, wearables, posters, newsletters, music artwork, ebooks, brochures, invites, magazines, book covers, social media content, signage, menus, business cards, just to name a few. Let's talk about specializing versus generalizing. A designer can and should specialize in something that he or she is considerably efficient in. Because a graphic designer usually fulfills the role of a multimedia designer. Specializing makes you more valuable for having specific knowledge about something. Generalizing leaves you less focused and clients may not know how to place you in their organization. So if you don't know what your speciality is just yet, take your time in exploring all areas. Eventually, there will be one or two particular design fields that you'll just fall in love with. Here are some areas a graphic designer can specialize in. Web design. Layout artist. Logo design. Typography. Motion graphics. A creative or art director. Or a photo editor or Photoshop artist. An interesting and meta way of learning about what a graphic designer really does 
is to simply Google quotes and even memes about graphic design. Here you will get a real world perspective, sometimes funny, sometimes harsh. So the good news is that you don't have to be a fine artist to become a graphic designer. You simply need to be good at communicating with visual elements. Let's take a look at some graphic design tools. Graphic design has essentially been around as long as humans have been communicating with one another. And before computers, designers would do everything manually, typesetting, sizing, colorizing, layout, cutting, gluing, waxing, photo manipulation, and all of it would take hours to do a simple task. If there was a mistake, it would most likely be, all have to be redone right from the beginning because there were no shortcuts. Over the years, technology advanced. The printing press was invented, then photography, then refined artistic tools, then the technology to have more control over these entities. There was a constant wave of pushing and refining tools and techniques that would speed up the design process, present more creative options, and make it so that one's imagination is literally the limit. Nowadays, graphic design is synonymous with digital technology and computers. Living in this time of electronic efficiency, graphic design has never been easier, faster, and more creatively applicable in history. The internet has now made it so that designers can teach and share their knowledge, creating a support base that pre-computer designers never had before. So let's take a look at some of the tools that make graphic design possible in this current modern age. Let's take a look at vectors versus pixels. One of your biggest decisions when creating a graphic is whether it will be vector-based or pixel-based, or both. When scaling up a pixel or raster graphic, the edges quickly become blocky and pixelated. Vectors, however, use mathematical algorithms and don't pixelate when scaled to its maximum size. Because vectors exist in a mathematical space, whereas pixels work in a more literal format. Pixels are easier to texturize and apply photographic filters to, whereas vectors are easier to scale and transform without loss of resolution. If a designer has to adjust or manipulate a photograph or pixel-based image, they would use raster design software such as Photoshop. A designer creates shapes, logos, and illustrated graphics using vectors in a vector editing program. This is why it's common to use both for any given design. Scaling up a pixel or raster graphic, the edges quickly become blocky or pixelated. When it comes to vector graphics, you can see that it is slightly cartoony, drawn or illustrated. Which means if you're designing a logo, designing icons or fonts, diagrams or illustrations, you'd probably use software like Adobe Illustrator, Inkscape, Affinity Designer, Vector or Coral Draw. Whereas if you are manipulating a pixel graphic, such as photo editing, cropping, recoloring, brightness and contrast, or applying effects and filters, you would use software like Adobe Photoshop, GIMP, Affinity Photo, Pixlr, and Coral Paint Shop. And some of the common file formats you'd use there would be JPEG, PNG, BMPs, GIFs, and TIFFs. So let's take a look at some of the graphic. Let's take a look at some of the graphic design software programs. Adobe Illustrator. The long-running industry standard from Adobe has been around since the 1980s. And in 2013 it shifted its pricing strategy by doing away with a once-off fee and using a monthly subscription model instead. Inkscape. Inkscape is arguably the best free and open source vector graphics editor. Because of its open source community, there are many great resources, tutorials and a helpful support base. 
It may be a little clunky compared to some of the other vector editors, but it can handle itself extremely well regarding other file formats as well as advanced vector manipulations and operations. Affinity Designer Illustrator might have the years of experience under its belt, but Affinity Designer, made by Serif, is right away extremely fast and powerful. It is packed with features that boost speed, productivity, creativity, and even tools that you never even knew you needed. Vector, an online-based vector editing program that is very easy to use and quick to learn. It comes with a downloadable desktop option, which has a few additional features. Vector is great for beginners and even non-designers who like to create professional looking graphics without too much of a steep learning curve. Adobe Photoshop. Photoshop is so well known that it has become a verb. Can you Photoshop my hair to be longer? It boasts a wide range of tools and functions that suit beginners and advanced designers alike. The GIMP. This free and open source alternative to Photoshop is incredibly powerful and due to its vast community, there is great support and many tutorials to ease in first-timers and enrich advanced users. Affinity Photo. It's quite apparent that award-winning Affinity Photo is well on its way to being one of the new industry standards. Affinity Photo is a potent force of impressive features and useful operations. Pixlr, like its sister software Vector, Pixlr is made for beginners and non-designers that need high-quality professional image editing software. Points and Lines It all starts here. Points The point is the first and simplest element of visual design. Points are the building blocks for everything. A modern graphic is made up of pixels which are a matrix of points on a screen or surface. And even outside of graphic design, points quite literally are the building blocks of everything. That object on the table next to you is made up of molecules and atoms, which are indeed physical points in space. An object on the table is a point on the table. The table in the room is a point in the room. The room in the house is a point in the house. The house becomes a point in the town. The town becomes a point in the country. The country is a point on Earth. And the Earth is a point in the solar system. And so on. You get the point. Points create two unique relationships. One, the size of the point and the space around it. And two, the location of the point in that space. Sometimes as points increase in size, we begin to see them as shapes. Want to see a magic trick? Things get pretty darn interesting when we add another dot. Do you see that? Immediately they are interacting with each other. These two dots have formed an invisible line that we cannot unsee. There actually is no line. It is simply an implied structure. We cannot help but see a suggested line between the two points. Let's see what happens when we add more points. Now it is a little more obvious. There is no square and there is no triangle. Yet that is what our brains are perceiving when we look at the seven dots here. Our minds immediately try and complete what is presented, which is a psychological action called closure. But more about that in the next section. In other words, our brains are hardwired to connect the dots. Let's take a look at lines. Famous German designer Paul Klee said a line is a dot out for a walk. 
We now understand that in some form or other, points create lines. Therefore, it stands to reason that lines connect points. Whether the lines are real or implied, they still belong to two or more points. So let's look at the three types of lines. Number one, an implied line. A series of points or figures that the eye automatically connects to to form an imaginary line. Examples include a trail of footprints, a line of cars, or a queue of people. Number two, a psychic line. No, it's not the hotline to your fortune teller. A psychic line is purely an invisible line from one element to another, followed by our eyes in our minds. Examples include a sign pointing in a direction, eyes staring at a particular spot, or maybe a person pointing at something. Number three, the contour line. These are the real lines that we can visually see. Contour lines make up forms and figures in design and drawings such as outlines, definition lines and shading lines. Let's take a look at line orientation. Horizontal lines convey a, st Horizontal lines convey a feeling of stillness, rest and lack of motion. Vertical lines or up and down lines convey a sense of height and alertness associated with trees, skyscrapers and walls. Diagonal lines, blending horizontal with vertical lines, offers a sense of movement and sometimes lack of stability. It can also indicate depth. Lines are amazing. They can be used to guide. Lines can be used to highlight. Lines can be used to emphasize. Lines can be used to separate, divide, break up or organize. Lines can be used to contain. Lines can also be used to create movement. Want to see another magic trick? Just by adding a few simple lines, I will make the cup move. Ta-da! With the power of two lines, I've made a hot beverage. These lines make the cup move at great speed. What happens when we change the direction of the lines? A few simple lines can change the entire story of a design. What can you communicate with just a few basic lines? Shapes The form of an object So this is where points and lines have brought us. If lines are points going for a walk, then shapes are lines going on a journey. Every shape we see and recognize has its origin from one of the three primitives. The primitives being the circle, the triangle and the square. Some shapes are a combination of two or more primitives. Let's look at the three types of shapes. Number one, geometric shapes. Mathematical in form and are derived from and inclusive of the primitive shapes. These include three-dimensional shapes too. Number two, organic shapes. Naturalistic and real form shapes that are mainly and abundantly found in nature. Although nature does have geometric shapes, such as the snowflake, organic shapes have no precise mathematical design to them. Number three, abstract shapes. This is pretty much the golden overlap between geometric and organic shapes. Abstract shapes share both mathematical and organic qualities and therefore include numbers, letters and symbols. Shape psychology. Have you ever noticed that most automobile logos are circular? There's a deliberate reason for that. Different shapes convey meanings and moods. The way our minds perceive shapes is directly based upon how we've experienced the world around us. So let's take a look at the three primitives, starting with the circle. Circles have no beginning or end. 
They represent the concept of eternity, wholeness and completion. Circular shapes convey a freedom of movement. They can roll, spin and orbit. They are instantly recognizable as a ball, wheel, fruit or a celestial body. So here are some real life examples of the circle as a logo, as a word mark, which is a logo in word form or letter form, or a symbol. The triangle. Triangles represent dynamic tension, action and aggression. Naturally associated with warnings. Think about thorns, teeth, spikes and so on. Stable when on its base, unstable when not. This stable-unstable dynamic gives triangles a sense of expectancy. Triangles can also direct movement depending on how they point. Here's some real life examples of the triangle. The square. Squares and rectangles convey stability. In fact, because of the stability, they convey equality, honesty, solidarity, and security. It is a trusted and familiar shape that suggests order. And although not found in nature, squares and rectangles are the most common geometric shape that humans encounter on a daily basis. Look at doors, pixels, books, screens, tiles, signs, windows, and so on. Let's take a look at the square in real life. Gestalt psychology, the sum of the parts. Gestalt is a German word meaning unified form. The Gestalt movement in the 1920s sought to make sense of how our minds perceive things as a whole rather than individual bits and pieces. Not long after being introduced into the psychology world, Gestalt was applied to visual perception. The main idea being that as we perceive the world around us, we receive lots of information at once. To process it all and to avoid our brains from melting from data overload, we visualize our environment in grouped forms. For example, we see lots of cars together as traffic and not one car at a time. It wasn't long before Gestalt principles were being harnessed for graphic design. So let's look at the seven principles of Gestalt. Number one, figure ground. Also known as positive and negative space, this principle plays directly on the fact that we perceive a focal point to be the background and a background to become the focal point. Our minds often perceive the smaller object in a design as the figure and the larger as the background. Figure ground is actually very widely used in logo design and certainly deserves a Google search. You may be surprised at how many familiar logos apply this, such as the Toblerone logo and its dancing bear. Number two, proximity. If elements are positioned close together, we perceive them as belonging to that group. Think collective nouns, a pile of laundry, a deck of cards, a cluster of stars, etc. The proximity principle states that grouped elements are processed as one thing by our minds. Number three, simplicity. The human brain will always try and perceive things in its simplest form. This is one of the ways we process information at every moment, even right now. We love to summarize and simplify. Why use words when an actual? Why use words when an icon will suffice? Number four, common fate. It's a bit of a dramatic name, but it's not wrong at all. If visual elements all point and move in the same direction, our minds perceive them as being together. Even if scattered at random at different sizes and colors, our minds still recognize a unity if the elements all face the same direction. We see this with a flock of birds or trees blowing in the same direction. Number five, closure. Finally, we have some closure on closure. Our brains have an amazing ability to fill in the blanks and complete unfinished entities. If enough of the element is suggested, we will immediately perceive its entirety. We also accept that elements are completed outside the frame, even though it isn't. Closure is a trick, to 
closure is a trick used by filmmakers, photographers and marketing experts. Number 6. Similarity Our minds automatically group elements that look the same. Like the principle of common fate, this principle transcends size, color and texture so long as they all look the same. This consistency creates an underlying unity which is why it's used so powerfully in branding. Number 7. Continuity When elements are aligned with each other in some form or another, we perceive them as being a single entity. The smoother and more uniform the entity, the more we see it as a unified shape. So when we see this, we struggle to see it like this. The continuity principle makes so that we see it like this. Boolean operations shapes from shapes. The interaction of shapes that create new shapes. George Boole was a British mathematician who introduced Boolean algebra in 1847. It denotes what is called truth values. The value is either true or not true. In the early 1900s, electrical engineers recognized that Boolean algebra was identical to the workings of electrical circuits. A true value would be on or one. A false value would be off or zero. This gave way to the creation of binary, which has been universally used across all electric circuits, even to this very day. So let's look at five Boolean operations. Simply by overlaying a triangle onto a circle, we can immediately create five new shapes. Boolean operations make it easier and quicker to achieve certain results that would usually take longer and be less accurate. Shapes are everywhere. Observe the shapes that make up an object's form, its shadows and its shine. Quick, look at five objects around you right now. Can you identify its inherent primitive shape? What about that cable? Is it rolled up or stretched out? What shape would you classify it under? How many objects are shapes made up from other shapes? Cool design tip. Use shapes that reinforce your message. Using even simple shapes, you can create symbolism that can enhance or reinforce the overall message of your design. As a graphic designer, keep figuring out new and fun ways to manipulate and use shapes to make a design work. Icon versus symbol. What is the difference between an icon and a symbol? An icon represents recognizable objects and visually icons closely resemble the very thing it's representing. Icons don't need prior knowledge to its meaning and therefore icons are used across language barriers. A symbol represents abstract concepts and ideas that are invisible hence the need for visual representation. Symbols are not restricted to physical objects and therefore require understanding of its meaning first. Take the five-year-old test. Ask a five-year-old to name all the images here. The ones they can identify are most likely icons. The ones they don't know or attempt to guess at are probably symbols. The yellow circles are all exactly the same in appearance, yet the meaning changes when given context. Conversely with the water, I have chosen several different ways to represent the exact same thing. In fact, it's incredible how the human brain can interpret meanings of letters, numbers and symbols despite radical differences in appearance. 
if an alien had to come and look at this top row of the letter B, for example, they would assume that they are completely different characters because they appear so differently from one another. Illustrations and photographs, however, are quite the opposite. In a picture, when the appearance changes, the specific meaning changes. With icons and symbols, meanings are implied. With pictures and images, meanings become literal. Let's take a look at the picture plane. Scott McCloud came up with the picture plane in his mind-blowing book Understanding Comics as a way to map visual possibilities. When we see a photo or realistic drawing of a face, we see it as someone else. But when we see an icon or a symbol of a face, we tend to see it as our own. Our minds fill in the gaps. Think about it. Superman, for example, has always been drawn with black side parted hair, with a little curl, a strong jawline and blue eyes. He has distinct features and details that solidify him visually into his character. Any actor portraying him would have to be carefully selected. Tintin, on the other hand, is basically a smiley face with a cowlick hairstyle on top. So when Tintin goes on one of his adventures, we go on one of his adventures too. Because in a way, we give life to Tintin simply by reading his stories. We essentially become Tintin. The world of Superman, however, is very simplistic and basic. Geometric shapes representing buildings. Metropolis could be portraying any thriving urban skyline. Tintin's world is quite the opposite. Very high in detail and virtually an immersive experience. So he is a visually basic character in a photorealistic environment and that allows us to be there too. Pictures are received information. The message is instant by way of resemblance. Iconography and writing is perceived information. Special knowledge is required to decode it and interpret it. Resemblance is stripped away to its basic meaning. The more pictures are abstracted from reality, they require greater levels of perception. The more words are literal and direct, the less levels of perception are required. Pure abstraction moves away from reality and meaning, and at the peak of the picture plane is pure shape, color and line. The picture plane maps the entire spectrum of visual representation. What are your favorite comics or graphic novels and where would they be plotted on the picture plane? Scale. Scale is the deliberate sizing of design elements. In graphic design, scale is used to highlight particular aspects of an idea. Large elements tend to move forward and smaller elements tend to move to the back, which creates a somewhat depth to the design. You will read this first before you read this. Scale can be used for emphasis as well as readability, metaphor, or even to reveal a hidden message. Scale, size, and proportion are all related concepts. Up doesn't exist without down, hot doesn't exist without cold, and so similarly, scale is a tool for contrasting. What is the difference between size, scale, and proportion? This is not a trick question. These three aspects are related, but different, like you and your weird cousins. Size, an absolute measurement. In graphic design, you'll make a lot of choices about size. Page size, screen size, text size, image size, margin size, file size, and storage size. Since size is an absolute measurement, you'll need specific dimensions and numbers before you even start designing. This links directly to knowing your target audience. Are you designing flyers for an old age home? 
Make sure the size of the text is large and readable. Are you designing for a billboard? Make sure the resolution size is correct or your design may look horribly pixelated by the time it is scaled up. By itself, size doesn't really mean much. If I told you the circle was 400 pixels across, it would be somewhat meaningless to you. 400 pixels, whoop de doo We can't tell if the circle is big or small until we compare it with something else. Scale, a relative comparison between sizes. Dictionary definition says that scale is a progressive classification of an attribute such as size, amount, or importance of rank. Therefore, scale can be used several ways in a design. It can be used as contrast, dominance or focal points, flow or rhythm, balance, or visual hierarchy. Proportion, the harmony of scale. Amateur portion, pro portion. Get it? Proportion, applied correctly, creates a sense of visual harmony and balance. Based on our experience of the world around us, we know that an aeroplane is much bigger than a human. And in the same way, we also know that a cat is quite smaller than a human. Therefore, if we see a cat that is larger than an aeroplane, we immediately question the proportions and simply classify it as humor, fantasy, or merely artistic impression. As humans, we base our perception of proportion upon the human body. In fact, most things are designed with the human body in mind. Doors and handles, tables and chairs, stairs and switches, tools, musical instruments. In graphic design, however, you will very rarely design something scaled for human proportions. And that fact reveals that there is a freedom to creatively explore and experiment with size, scale and proportion. Color theory. The science of color is called either chromatics or colorimetry. It studies the perception of color by the human eye and brain. And before we get into the psychology of color, we first need context of the physics of color. Let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from radio waves to gamma rays. The electromagnetic spectrum is, basically speaking, the range of light or radiation frequencies. Let's zoom in on this section over here. To humans, only a very, very small fraction, 0.0035% of the entire spectrum, is visible to us and our eyes, and yet it is enough to see everything. Certain animals have extended visibility to see things that we can't, Snakes, for example, have infrared vision, which is to us perceived as heat, whereas bees have ultraviolet vision. The color wheel. Let's take a look at the primary colors. Red, yellow, and blue. Every color in the visible spectrum originates from these three colors. Secondary colors orange, green, and violet, the pure overlap between the primary colors. Orange is created from mixing red and yellow, green is created from mixing yellow and blue, and violet is created from mixing blue and red. The tertiary colors, red orange, yellow orange, yellow green, blue green, blue violet and red violet the space joining a primary color to a secondary color now these colors do have official names but for the sake of teachability we're just calling it this for now the 
representation of color. RGB, which stands for red, green, and blue, is created with light, as we'll see it on pixels, monitors, and screens, anything that is projected or displayed with light. Colors are additive with RGB. The more colors, the lighter the image. That means all colors make pure white. CMYK, which stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, or key, which is black, is created with ink or chemicals, seen mainly on paper and material. Colors are subtractive in CMYK. The more colors, the darker the image. All colors of CMYK put together make black. So RGB is displayed on screen with light. CMYK is usually printed onto a surface using chemicals. HSL values are a modern alternative to RGB and CMYK that most design programs use. By applying the HSL method, you can easily and quickly select and control any color you need. The H stands for hue, which is the pure color without any tint or shade. Let's select this green over here and apply it to the next level, which is saturation, the S, which is the colorfulness of a particular hue. It's either full color or no color at all. Let's move it about here. The lightness, which is the brightness or the darkness of that particular value. And we'll move it to about here. And that is our final HSL value. Tint, shade, and tone. Taking a pure color and adding white is a tint. Taking a pure color and adding black is a shade, and adding gray to a pure color is a tone. So let's look at the six essential color schemes of graphic design. Number one, monochromatic which is basically variations of one hue. Number two, analogous. Colors in the same area on the color wheel. Color scheme number three, complementary, which is two opposite ends of the color wheel. Number four, a triad which is three equally spaced colors on the color wheel. Number five, split complementary. It's when you split an opposing complementary node into two on the color wheel. And finally, number six, the tetrad, which is four colors arranged into two complementary pairs. Design tip, limit your colors. When communicating visually, less is more, more or less. And so whether you're using a bright tetrad color scheme or a minimal monochromatic color scheme, keep your colors to an absolute minimum. Another design tip is to keep colors similar. If the main color of your design is, for example, orange, use a tint, shade, or tone of that orange or colors that harmonize with it. Design without color first. It is important to note that a particular design must be able to work without any color first. If you design in color first, there is a possibility that your design may be viewed in grayscale and your design won't work as intended. Color Psychology Of all the design elements, color can be the most effective due to its ability to affect us mentally and physically. When choosing colors for a design, it is vital to understand how the human brain interprets specific colors so that it can be used smartly and not simply because it looks cool. In some cases, color psychology goes beyond what works and what doesn't work. Because in certain cultures, specific colors that are fun and friendly to you and me may have negative and sinister connotations because of their meaning to that specific culture. 
For example, here are the colors of mourning in different cultures. Here are some color psychology stats. 85% of shoppers place color as a primary reason for why they buy a product. 80% of brand recognition can be enhanced by color and color can improve learning by 70%. Red, a warm and demanding color that has more associations than any other color. At the one end of the visible spectrum, red disappears into infrared or below red, which we cannot see but rather sense as heat. Associations of red include blood, fire, danger, rage, courage, ceremony, Christmas, attention, warmth, passion, speed, honor, and love. The effects of red is that it stimulates energy, increases blood pressure, and stimulates appetite. Notice how many fast food companies have red branding. Red increases enthusiasm and it encourages action. Some facts about the color red. Red poppies are worn to honor soldiers. Red symbolizes ceremony. Red carpets welcome distinguished guests. Doctors wear scarlet gowns upon graduating. A warship hoisting a red flag indicated no mercy would be shown. In Asian cultures, red is a traditional wedding color believing to bring good fortune. And on a national flag, reds on national flags and on national flags, red symbolizes blood and sacrifice. Yellow, the happiest, most playful and most optimistic color. Golden hues are associated with new mornings, cheerful sunflowers and radiant sunlight. Yellow is associated with joy, happiness, optimism, vitality, sunshine, gold and cheer. The effects that yellow has on us is that it activates memory, stimulates certain mental processes and encourages communication. Facts about yellow, it is the most visible color on the entire spectrum. Yellow's high visibility is precisely why some cities use it for fire trucks and taxis. Its high visibility also makes it a logical choice for warning signs, safety equipment and construction vehicles. Legal documents are mostly on yellow paper because of how it stimulates memory. Blue. Cool and calm, blue is the most trustworthy color. Associated with the sky and the sea, things that are always there evoke a strong sense of dependability. Blue is associated with the sky, with water, and with being cold. Effects that blue has, it, is a, it has a calming effect, a cooling effect, and blue boosts intuition. Facts about the color blue. Mosquitoes are doubly attracted to blue more than any other color. Blue is the color of mourning in Mexico. Productivity increases in rooms painted blue. And tests have shown that when we meet a group of new people, we will most likely be drawn to those wearing blue. Green. The balance between dependable blue and happy yellow. Green is associated with growth, money, nature, and health. The effects of green is that it is relaxing, it alleviates depression, and it is soothing. Facts about the color green. Rich people in the Middle Ages who weren't from nobility wore green. Green comes from the Germanic origin meaning to grow. Green is the color our eyes are most sensitive to, so it appears to occupy the largest area of the color spectrum. Thought to improve eyesight, but it is merely less taxing on the eye than most other colors. Orange. A blend of red's energy with yellow's optimism makes orange a youthful, enthusiastic color. Orange is associated with vitality, youth, fun, flamboyancy, caution, and citrus. The effects of orange is that it encourages activity, it encourages socializing. Some facts about orange. Being the complementary or opposite color of blue, 
Orange is the most visible against water, making it a logical color for life jackets and boys. A friendlier version of red makes orange a safe color for safety warnings, such as traffic cones, safety vests, and traffic lights, and so on. In Chinese religions, orange symbolizes transformation. And the black box date and the black box data recorder from an airplane is actually orange so that it can be found easily after a plane crash. Violet, an interesting combination of dependable blue with the energy of red. Violet is associated with royalty, extravagance, individuality, and vanity. Its effects are that it is motivating, it is calming, and it encourages creativity. Some facts about violet. Scientifically, purple and violet are two different colors. Purple is a non-spectral color, whereas violet is. In the 15th century, the processes of creating purple dye was long, difficult, and expensive, which is why only royalty could attain it. Thousands of sea snails were removed from their shells and left to soak. A tiny gland was then removed from which mucus was extracted and then placed into sunlight. The sunlight turned the juice white and then yellow-green, then violet, and then a red that went darker and darker. This process had to be stopped at the exact moment to get the desired color, and finally the fabric could be dyed. Brown, a composite color made by blending a primary color with a secondary color. It is associated with nature, wilderness, strength, solidarity, stability, health, and luxury. The effects brown has is that it evokes a sense of stability and it highlights masculinity. Facts about the color brown. It is not found on the color wheel, but it is abundantly found in nature. Because brown blends into the backgrounds, it makes a great color choice for fashion and interior design. Associated with good eating, brown bread, brown sugar, brownies, and so on. Brown is associated with luxury, having connotations with leather, rich wood, gourmet coffee, and fine chocolate. Pink. Maintaining the high energy of red minus the aggression. Pink is associated with romance, sugar, tenderness, sensitivity, femininity, and softness. The effects of pink is that it is tranquilizing, it highlights femininity, stimulates an appetite for sweetness, and it encourages friendliness. Some interesting facts about pink is that it's actually a pale red rather than a composite color. In fact, red is the only color whose lighter shades have an official different name. In the late 1960s, Alexander Schaus observed that the Baker Miller pink physically reduced heart rate and muscle strength and was eventually used in prisons across the world, including Al Capone's prison cell. Sports teams sometimes paint the change rooms used by their opponents in shades of pink to reduce aggression. Public surveys in Europe and North America showed that pink was more popular with older people than with younger people. Due to its feminine quality, Pink is the color of breast cancer awareness, the feminist initiative in Sweden, and Code Pink, a women's anti-war group in the USA. Gray, the great neutral. Gray is associated with wisdom, security, maturity, dependability, and metals. Gray has a non-invasive effect, and it creates a sense of expectation. Some facts about gray. It is known as an archaic color or a color without color. Because gray is so neutral, the human eye can pick up 6% of color saturation in any gray. The human eye can also detect over five, the human eye can also detect over 400 shades of gray. Black, the complete absorption or absence of light. Black is associated with authority, with power, sophistication, space, mourning, and elegance. The effects that black has is that it offers the feeling of space and it creates a sense of weight. Facts about the color black. It usually comes together with white, 
It's affiliation with tuxedos, top hats, priests, judges, scholars, special ops, limousines, and so on makes black a color of influence and authority. Psychologically, a black box will feel heavier than an identical box of another color. Movie villains can usually be spotted by wearing lots of black. And in fashion, black is the color of elegance. White, the color of all light. White is associated with purity, softness, peace, innocence, and newness. The effects that white has is that it encourages clutter reduction, it aids clarity, and creates a sense of new beginnings. Some facts about white. In 1666, Sir Isaac Newton demonstrated that white light can be broken up into its composite colors by passing it through a prism and then back into a second prism to reassemble them. In some Asian countries, white is the color of mourning. White wedding dresses symbolize purity. Lab and medical coats used to be beige until the late 1800s, which was a time of great medical progress. As society realized the benefits of sterilization and cleanliness, the white coat symbolized this way of thinking. Associated with positive ideals, weddings, picket fences, clouds, daisies, doves, openness, and blank canvases. Topography Why topography matters Topography is everywhere It's in our clothing, our music, our money, our productivity, our time, books, electronics, beverages, food, businesses, venues, sports, transport, tools, appliances and entertainment It is not just the design of the characters and the letters It's also how they are arranged and manipulated you can play with the spacing. You can play with the point size. You can play with the line length, as well as the alignment of the text. Previously, we dealt with shapes and how they affect our perceptions. We also explored icons and symbols and how our brains process what we see. The combination of these two principles is what makes topography such a powerful aspect of graphic design. And yes, the human brain is sensitive enough to be able to detect the effect of these tiny details. A single character on its own can also visually communicate a multitude of things. W could mean West. It is the symbol for tungsten. It could mean Watts whiskey and in morse code it's dot dash dash here's an example of shape psychology and topography the wonderful world of design this lovely bold text on the left is a beautiful font called ultra which is free from google fonts if you need to find it designed for power headlines and impactful titling as bulky and strong as this font may look our eyes instantly pick up on the fact that it is friendly and not aggressive it has the personality of a big friendly giant or a large cuddly bear. A zoomed in perspective will reveal why. The first thing our eyes pick up on are these big square serifs that give the font a solid grounding, giving us the sense of stability and reliability. The second thing our eyes pick up on are the big circular curves which give a sense of gentleness and friendliness. Taking a closer look at fonts like this can give you a better indication as to why they evoke certain moods. And it can also help you select fonts more effectively for what a design requires. Since letters and numbers are already a form of pictogram, it makes sense to apply them in the same way we would apply any other graphic design element, such as color or texture. Selecting fonts for a design is like selecting clothes for an occasion. 
you wouldn't wear a tuxedo to go scuba diving or you wouldn't wear pajamas to a wedding. A typeface can hinder the seriousness or urgency of a design. The bottom caution, although it's written very beautifully, is impractical as it's not very readable if it were placed in a factory or a place of work. A font on its own can even change the entire context of what is being communicated. Typeface terminology. Let's look at some typeface anatomy. Here's the ascent line and the descent line, the mean line and the base line, and the gap in between is called the X height. This is called the bar, that's called the stem. The descender, because it goes from the base line to the descent line. This is called the counter, a, a closed counter. That is called a bowl. This is called a link. This is called an ear. And this is called a loop. This is a terminal. This is an ascender because it's going up to the ascent line. This is an open counter. And this is called a shoulder. And this is called a tail. Typeface designation the readout you'd commonly see on most design software. This is the typeface itself. This is the style of the typeface. This is the weight of that typeface. And this is the size of the typeface. The typeface and the style is called the font. Font weight, the thickness of each letter. You've heard of bold before. You also get ultralight, light, regular, medium, and bold. Sometimes you also get black. Font width, the designed width of each letter. Extended fonts save you from having to stretch a font out if you need text to spread out over a certain space. Condensed fonts are the same thing, but instead of squeezing or squishing a font together, it is proportionally designed to take up less space on a line. Warning, never stretch text. Rather find an extended typeface to increase width or a condensed typeface to increase height or even rather use tracking or scaling. As you can see the vertically stretched text, you can see it's disproportioned and you can see it's been stretched whereas the same typeface has been replaced with a condensed style and looks much more pleasing to the eye. Here is text that has been stretched horizontally and once again you can see that it's been stretched. If you look at the E, you can see the vertical part is thicker than the horizontal parts, whereas the extended style, everything is in proportion and looks good. Letter spacing. Kerning is the spacing between individual letters or characters. Whereas tracking is the spacing between letters as applied to the entire word or line. And you can see this will come in useful, particularly if you look at the V and the A, how they interact. When using tracking, the V and the A seem quite far apart, but with kerning, you can shift that V over closer to the A to fill that gap nicely. Tracking examples. This is tight tracking, normal tracking, and loose tracking. And depending on what your design requires, will determine what kind of tracking you need. Leading. Leading is the vertical space between lines of text. And once again, whatever your design needs will determine the leading of your text. Let's look at text alignment. Left aligned text is anchored to the left. Right aligned text is anchored to the right. Centered text is weighted to the middle. And justified text is anchored to either side. Get a good rag. 
When aligning text, make sure the rag is as straight and clean as possible. This is quite a, a jagged rag and you want something like this or even like this for professional looking text. Avoid orphans and widows. An orphan is a line or a word that falls to the beginning of the next line at the bottom of a block of text, creating separation from the rest of the text. And in the same way, a widow is the end of a sentence or a line or a word that pushes out to the beginning of the next column or page, also separated from its paragraph. In design, this is seen as a no-no and it looks very unprofessional. So there are three ways to avoid orphans and widows. Number one, you can adjust the width or the length of your text frame or text box. Number two, you can adjust the optical margin alignment, which a lot of design software allows you to do. And number three, you can adjust the tracking or kerning of your text. This should solve the problem of widows and orphans. So what is the difference between a font and a typeface? This is a typeface and just one of those is a font and you can download railway for free from google fonts it's a great font to use um, it can be used for formal and informal occasions and designs Typeface classification. Typefaces can be categorized in many different ways with loads of subcategories depending on the book or website that you're on. So for the sake of teachability, we're going to keep things easy and simple. The four main typography classifications are serif fonts, sans serif fonts, script fonts, and display fonts. Let's look at serif fonts. Serifs are elegant, classical and sophisticated and used for more formal orientated designs. Serifs are also called barbs or feet. Most serif typefaces have thick and thin sections to them. Serif fonts also have terminals and they have brackets. Serifs create a visual connection between each character, making it easier for the human eye to read in printed material. If you pick up any book, magazine or newspaper, you will see it for yourself. Here are the subcategories for serif typefaces. Old style, traditional, neoclassical, slab serifs and glyphic serifs. Famous examples of serif typefaces. Honda uses Mulhouse. HSBC uses Times New Roman. Canon uses Legba. Sony uses Clarendon. And Forbes uses Publico. Sans serif. Geometric, modern and simple. For more informal orientated designs. Sans is French for without. So without any serifs, words appear more streamlined and geometric. Sans serif typefaces are used the most across the web for its ease of readability on screens. Subcategories for sans serif typefaces are grotesque, neo grotesque, humanist, and geometric. Here are some famous examples of sans serif typefaces Toshiba uses Eurostyle, Adidas uses Futura, 3M uses Helvetica. BBC uses Gil Sands, and YouTube uses Alternative Gothic No. 2. Script. Handwritten, calligraphic, and organic, for headings both formal and informal. Script typefaces are swirly, flowing, and usually mimic handwriting or calligraphy. The subcategories include formal, calligraphy, handwritten, and black letter. Famous examples of script typefaces include Coca-Cola, which is Spencerian script, Kellogg's, which uses Barley script, Hallmark uses Channel, Cadbury and H&M use custom script typefaces. Display. 
decorative, fun, and playful for headings and titles. Display typefaces are novelty fonts used primarily for decorative purposes, usually for show rather than practicality. Display fonts may include serif, sans serif, and script typefaces, but in a way that is ornamental, flamboyant, or dressed up, as they say. Subcategories for display typefaces go way more than this list I've got here, but some of them include cartoon, retro, grunge, stencil, techno, and decorative. Famous examples of display typefaces. CNN, Orange, Zildjian, Wonka, and Walkman all have custom display typeface fonts. Warning, never use script or display typefaces for body text. Use them for headings only. As you can see here, script and display typefaces do not work for body text. However, serif and sans serif are very readable. Pairing fonts. Pairing and mixing fonts can be such a delicate task that even the most experienced designers often bungle it up. So here are three safe techniques to apply when pairing fonts. Number one, opposites attract. Contrast is your mighty ally when pairing fonts. It's akin to balancing two colors or shapes. Number two, be complementary. Since each typeface and font has its own personality and mood, pair them in a harmonious fashion. Number three, keep it in the family. There's no safer way to pair fonts than by using one typeface that comes with a large selection of styles and weights. Dangerous fonts to avoid. Comic Sans, the most hated font in the universe. No other font comes close by way of hate sites, petitions, and entire movements to ban it. Designed for user-friendly computer tutorials in the early 90s, it was included into the Windows 95 library of fonts and was immediately overused for being the only kid-friendly font to choose from. The individual characters are imbalanced, causing problems when trying to align it. One upside is that, because of its imperfections, it is a recommended typeface for those with dyslexia. If you change your font to Comic Sans on Skype Messenger, the emoji icon turns into a sad face. Here are some safe alternatives. Dojo Toon, Architect's Daughter, Hockey is Liff, Annie Use Your Telescope, and Kavit Brush. Papyrus, the one hit wonder. Meant to imitate the writings one would find on ancient scrolls, but the novelty wears off quickly, making it appear as if the designer thinks they're the only person who has discovered it. As a result, it only works once. The second highest grossing movie in history, Avatar, uses Papyrus for its main title. This created a lot of ridicule and even spawned an entire comedy sketch for Saturday Night Live with Ryan Gosling. Here are some safe alternatives to Papyrus. Pompeii Petite, Skia, Lithos Pro, Marathon, and Macondo Swash. Times New Roman, the original default typeface. British newspaper The Times commissioned a pair of designers for a new font in 1931. The result was Times New Roman. Design-wise, this is actually a really great typeface designed to save space and increase clarity. Sadly, it was set as the default typeface for 15 years in Microsoft Windows applications from version 3.1 to Vista. During this period, 1992 to 2007, using computers for school and business work went from when to being fresh and trendy to commonplace. Being overly overused, it eventually wore out its impact and lost its intended sophistication. Here are some safe alternatives to Times New Roman. Playfair Display 
Bodoni, Noto Serif, Callisto, and Bookman Old Style. Here are some more fonts to be avoided. Ariel says, I want to be Helvetica when I grow up. Rather use Helvetica. Calibri, too lazy to change the default. Rather use Railway. Lobster, look mom, I'm retro. Rather use Streetwear. Impact, I'm only good for memes. Rather use Oswald. Courier New, it's not really a typewriter. Did I trick you? Rather use Special Elite. Mistral, I'm a 90s sitcom. Rather use Dancing Script. Pacifico, ahoy matey. Rather use Le Curly One. Bradley Hand, it's not really handwriting. Did I trick you? Rather use Kalam. Vivaldi, I wish there was more calligraphy fonts. Rather, rather use Parisienne. Let's take a look at some champion fonts. Trajan, a strong dramatic typeface based on the letter forms from Trajan's column in Rome. Holding both readability and beauty, this font is perfect for a very wide range of designs. In just movie posters alone, there are around 500 Hollywood movies using Trajan in their designs. This is a typeface that truly and simply stands the test of time. Futura, the king of geometric typefaces, literally designed around the three primitive shapes, circle, square, and the triangle. Developed in 1927 to capture the spirit of modernity, it was proudly dubbed the typeface of today and tomorrow, and it remains a well-used and friendly design. It is also the first typeface on the moon. The stainless steel plaque commemorating the first moon landing is aptly typed in Futura. Helvetica, the most popular typeface in history. It has its own section in the Museum of Modern Art and it even has its own documentary. Developed in 1957, based on Swiss designs, Helvetica has been adapted into every language including Greek, Arabic and Thai alphabets. It is also the most imitated typeface, having over 30 lookalikes. Helvetica is virtually everywhere we go and shows no sign of losing its enduring impact. Awesome fonts to be downloaded. Montserrat, a playful and professional font. Exo, which is technological and elegant. Serena, casual and chunky. Oswald, efficient and fresh. Eurostyle, futuristic and memorable. Ultra, friendly and dramatic. Lavandera, formal and classic. Sinzel, sophisticated and classy. Rockwell, solid and easy. Here are some typography tips. Number one, limit the amount of fonts you use in a design. Use two or three at the most, or else your design may start looking cluttered and amateurish. Even the busy looking Jack Daniels design only has three fonts, which are carefully stylized and matched. Tip number two, do the scale test. Bring up your design on your screen and try and get it as close to the actual size as possible. Then move away as far away from the screen as you possibly can. Is it still readable? Tip number three, use glyphs and special characters. You don't only have to use punctuation marks for punctuation. You're not even restricted to the modern English alphabet. Incorporate special characters and symbols from various alphabets to add an exotic edge to your designs. Tip number four. Always use white text on an image. When placing text on a photograph or picture, always, always, always use white. Yes, there might be exceptions and there's no official design law that forces you, but white text on an image is a guaranteed method to keep a design looking super professional. But white text on an image is a guaranteed method to keep a design looking super professional. Tip 
But what if the picture is white? Don't be tempted to change the color of the text. Keep it all white. Instead, turn the brightness of the image down just enough so that the text becomes clear and readable. Composition Composition is the deliberate arrangement of elements in a design. Having all the perfectly cut pieces of the puzzle is one thing. Organizing them to form a functional, working whole is a completely different feat entirely. So let's look at the three stages of composition. The three stages of composition has focal element as its foundation. On top of that rests structure, then sitting right on the top is balance. So let's take a look at focal element. Whether it's the starting point on a street map or the main message of a poster, the focal element is literally the foundation of composition, as our eyes need some sort of visual anchor as a reference point. Here's a picture with no focal point. And here is a picture with a focal point. A focal element or point of focus can be achieved in five different ways. Number one, camera focus. A crisp shape against a blurred background or amongst blurred shapes is a foolproof way of achieving a good focal point. Here are some examples of camera focus. Number two, guiding lines. Guiding lines can literally direct the eyes of the viewer to where you need them to look. This can be done in the form of implied lines, beams of light, motion, and even text. Here are some examples. Number three, color. Introduce a contrasting color to stand out amongst everything else. Here are some examples. Number four, scale. By changing the size of an element, you can make it stand out from everything else, and this can work both ways. Here are some examples. Number five, framing. Framing can come in many forms, such as margins, cropping, and even negative space or isolation. Here are some examples of framing. And on that note, white space or negative space is just as effective as any other framing device. As you can see, the graphic on the left, it's very busy. It's still a nice graphic, but for some reason we prefer the white space. It draws our eyes as a focal point to the center of that page. It draws intrigue. It makes us interested in, in what that bicycle is all about. The three stages of composition focal element, structure, and balance. Let's take a look at structure. As we've seen, the human brain is hardwired to perceive things in a particular way. The way our eyes scan for information has revealed methods that increase how much data we take in and how fast we take it in. Structure is placing the elements based on how we see. So let's look at three of the most common methods of structure in graphic design. First one is the rule of thirds. Overlaying a tic-tac-toe grid over an image divides the image into nine equal parts. 
the intersection points of these lines and the lines themselves are where your focal point should be placed to create a strong, balanced image. In a design, you want to place your most important elements in at least one of these intersections, such as a heading or an event date and so on, so that the reader's eyes snaps there first. Here are some examples of the rule of thirds, just in book covers. Here is a poster for a concert. When we overlay the rule of thirds guidelines, we can immediately see that the main heading is placed nicely in the top left hand third of the poster. This photo of the soldier and the children is well balanced and we can tell because the soldier and the children's faces are well placed within the thirds. This movie poster for Little Miss Sunshine puts all the action in the lower right third. In fact, most of the poster happens around the lower third. Let's look at the golden ratio. The golden ratio. How this works is you start with a square and you duplicate it and this forms a little rectangle. Now you create another square at the height of that rectangle and there you have the foundation of the golden ratio or the golden thirds. You repeat this process as many times as you wish and it goes on infinitely and as you can see it forms a spiral. Sometimes this is referred to as the divine ratio because it's literally found everywhere. You find it in music, in art, mathematics, architecture, acoustics, science, engineering and we also see it in nature. Crystals, vegetation, animals, climatology, geology. Seriously, it's worth a Google. We see it in websites. We see it in product design. The golden ratio is even there in our social media. Here are some examples from movies and paintings. The eye naturally follows to a specific area on the screen. And now artists and filmmakers are very aware of this golden ratio. So be sure to look out for it the next time you watch a film. If we used each square for a different sized circle, we can end up creating the most astonishing things. Can you see it yet? As you can see, the Apple logo and the Twitter logo are created by using circles based off of the golden ratio. Symmetry. The Greek origin for the word symmetry means agreement in dimensions. Symmetry is when the elements are arranged the same way on both sides of a central axis. Perfect symmetry is achieved with mirror-like effect. Similarly to the golden ratio, symmetry is also inherent in many things such as physics, biology, chemistry, music, architecture and even literature such as palindromes. There are three types of symmetry you get. The first type is reflectional symmetry, which as the name implies, uses one central axis to create a symmetrical or mirror-like effect. Then you get rotational symmetry, which is when something is symmetrical when rotated on a central point. Lastly, you get Transitional symmetry. Transitional symmetry is a repeated pattern that could be on more than one axis and could also be a combination of reflectional and rotational symmetry. The three stages of composition, focal element, structure, and balance. Let's take a look at balance. When the visual weight of an image balances well, it pleases the human eye. Using focal element and structure will create strong foundation for you to add balance to your composition. When all three of these parts draw attention equally, balance has been achieved. 
This picture is unbalanced because there is no focal element. And even if we decided to use the bench or bush as a focal element, they are not following the rule of thirds or the golden ratio or even symmetry. This picture, however, is balanced because we have two focal points that complement each other. A large dark balloon in the upper third balancing nicely with a small bright sunburst in the lower right third. There are two types of balance. Symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical balance aligns itself by default, but asymmetrical balance is achieved in six different ways. Through tone, color, scale, texture, shape, and space. Let's recap the three stages of composition. We start with our focal element, then our choice of structure, which in this case the photographer went with the rule of thirds, and then a type of balance to finish it off. Texture Untextured elements and textured elements Visual texture, appearing as actual texture, is used to subtly evoke certain feelings. In graphic design, the use of textures introduces a sense of realism and familiarity. For example, when we see the water droplets on a soft drink advert, our brains tell us, from experience, that those objects indicate something cold, frosty and refreshing. The essence of great texturing is to make it so that no one notices that it's there, 